Thank you, Aidan, um, for that for that nice introduction. So, um, and and thank you to the the UI for organising this lecture, and you, Aidan, for doing the first lecture, which I think very much focused on the interrelationship between robots and the urban human, particularly through policing, security, and other sorts of um, applications. So, what I want to do in this lecture is think about the relationship between the robotic and the, the ecological. And um, it was interesting, when I was putting this together, I was really, it really reminded me of perhaps, in, it took me back to 1990, when I just um, started being, um, an, working as an academic, I think at Newcastle University. And I did a, a short term placement with British Telecom, who were the telecoms incumbent provider uh, way back over 30 years ago and it was all about the relationship between telecommunications and sustainability it was that period of a uh, local agenda 21 and what was interesting about that work was their hope and expectation that telecoms would be through dematerialization telecoms transport trade-offs subst electronic substitution of travel yet what the work showed through the academic literature was a much more complex set of interrelationships between the environmental, ecological and telecommunications. And so the same with robotics 30 years later. Now, in this work, I want to acknowledge um, the collaboration with colleagues um, at Sheffield, Aidan, um, two former colleagues, Rachel McQuarrie and, and um, uh, and Andy Lockhart, um, also Mat Matea Kovacic, um, and also colleagues at um, Sheffield, at, at Sydney University in the Smart Urban Lab and the Centre for Field, Field Robotics here. And I think what we've, what we've been trying to sort of work through co uh, collaboratively is what, what sort of, it, what's the interrelationship between robotics and the ecological? Is this, do, do robotics, and humans work together to save the planet? Does, do, do robots themselves um, uh, save the planet? Or does the planet become increasingly um, automated and robotized? And I discovered this sort of whole genre of um, image production that was trying to think about these interrelationships um, as illustrated by um, this slide. Now, what I'm particularly want to try to tease out in, in terms of these relationships is 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 the relation is is ro robotic and environmental uh, relations is this about mitig is this about carbon reduction um do robots offer enhanced capacities to reduce carbon emissions or is this about security um do, 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 does, does does robotics enable us to secure environments um through, through processes of adaption to uh, meteorological turbulence and climate change? Or is there something else going on here? Um, is this actually about the role of ro robots in ensuring that ecosystems and environments and nature can continue working in an in in increasingly um, degraded and climatically uncertain context? And I think that's the interesting question that we need to sort of try to tease out and understand about the interrelationship between the robotic and the ecological. Is this a claim that we actually need to intervene in biophysical processes to enable ecosystems to continue to function and work effectively through a technically artificially mediated capacity? Now, when you start to look at the sort of wider context in which um, the industry is talking about um, environment, you find all sorts of claims are being made about the sustainability of robotics, their ability to fight wildfires, um, undertake waste management, restore the oceans, develop renewable energy and provide sustainable agriculture. There's loads of examples that are trying to mobilize this idea about the green robot um, uh, the market niches that should every, everybody should uh, know about. And these wonderful stories about how robots um, um, are helping to avert climate disaster. And that story in, that's, that story in the, uh, the bottom left is about 
a monitor that was placed on a seal on the Antarctic Ocean that noticed um, a, a warming gradient at the head of a, uh, a glacier um, that was confirmed later by uh, a maritime robot. But even within the sort of robotic sector, there's a recognition that um, the role of robots may not be, um, it's not necessarily a green savior. Um, uh, as the debate around the telecommunications and digital smart technologies, there's questions around energy consumption, the role of robotics in accelerating resource consumption and depletion, and the question about how they reshape um, the uh, distribution of hazards between humans and, the mach and machines. But the sector, um, the sort of really um, a, a, around robotic engineering uh, in many domains is, is, is sort, of sort of trying to think about these questions. There's a really interesting book by Mangus Egerstrad, which is about robotic ecology, which is about robots that operate in um, out extreme environments of outer space or plan for environments where they need to actually, robots actually might need to build autonomy through their ability to utilize, for example, um, PVs to, to enable them to survive in, in degraded environments. And there's also a debate around soft robots that are made of bi biogradable materials um, that, that perhaps are less harmful um, in terms of their interrelationship with the environment. So the, the industry is sort of slightly aware that it needs to, th it needs to think about some of these questions. Now, what I want to try and do in this talk is think about the way in which the robotic is being thought in relation to the ecological. And um, in particular, how we think of the interrelationship between digital and smart technologies and um, robotic, capac robotic capacities and robotic functions. And what I want to argue is that I think we've got a reasonably good understanding of the way that smart digital technologies enhance our capacity to understand, monitor, uh, and sense ecological conditions. So our, no our knowledge of um, planet Earth and our knowledge of conditions, particularly in urban context, has been significantly enhanced by the ability of smart and digital technologies um, and monitoring systems to build um, a, a much better understanding of the different uh, environmental components, of not just of global ecosystems, but of urban systems as well through, through environmental sensing technologies. And that's sort of, uh, there's a really good book by Jennifer Gabris on Program Earth, looking at the notion of a sort of computational planet. Um, in, the, in the environmental literature, there's the emergence of sort of specialist journals like on di around digital earth. And there's been this whole shift in sort of smart cities to the sort of interrelationship between environmental sensing and an understanding of water, uh, atmospheric air quality, all sorts of sort of environmental conditions. And I suppose what's important about this is this is about our, our capacity to analyze and understand and monitor environmental conditions and ecosystems which is significantly enhanced through these technical capacities. Now, what we need to think about is the way in which robots relate to this already existing context of knowing, um, knowing environments. And what's, the distinctive, what's distinctive about the capacity and functionality that robotic interventions uh, provide that extends upon this sort of platform of digital smart sensing of environments. So the way to think about it um, is if digital technologies and smart systems can provide help with diagnose, monitoring and diagnosing um, ecological conditions, problems, um, uh, opportunities for intervention, about knowing the environment and knowing ecology through a particular set of technologies and systems, which exclude other ways of knowing. The additionality of robotics is that they provide a functional capacity that enables intervention in those ecological systems 
and environments. So if smart and digital technologies enhance our capacity to know, we need to think as, as, around robotics as providing a capacity to act within ecosystems. Now, that's really quite a fundamental shift that I think, as I want to try and show um, and tease out, is that ability to act uh, materially through the movement of, of robots in ecologies really significantly changes the way that we have to think about different types of ecosystems. Now, in, in saying that, there's a multiplicity of different types of robots that exist in the, um, uh, that are applied in these sort of ecosystemic contexts. Some of them are really quite simple. Some of them are about the movement of surfaces. Um, so the sort of stationary robots in, the, in that top row there. Others are wheeled, others have legs, others operate as swimming, flying, as swarms, and they crawl, they can be soft, they can be hands, they can be hybrid type of robots in, in encompassing a multiplicity of functionalities. So for the purposes of this talk, I want to think about uh, robots in terms of forms of kinetic movement, about how movement is a form of intervention in an, in an ecosystem, from the movement of surfaces, uh, as well as the sort of interconnection between a robot and plant, or in the bottom of the illustration there, robots cleaning up a beach. Now, as a starting point, what I want to be clear, these robots are glitchy, they go wrong, they're not always reliable. They can often fail. These robots require huge, large, significant infrastructures around them of humans, often humans doing really mundane and boring work or human specialist humans to make them operate effectively. Um, there's all sorts of problems with these robots. But the ecological context I think is a really significant and emerging context where robots are being trialed, tested, and utilized in quite extensively. So I'm sort of quite aware that some of this sounds slightly science fictiony, but a lot of the examples I'm talking about here, these are um, these are these are not just experiments and demonstrations, they're they are products and services that are available that are already available and being applied significantly. And I think that's one of the interesting things is that if you want to look for contexts where robotics are being utilized, it's not necessarily the urban context, it's in other sorts of um, e environmental contexts, remote contexts, agricultural contexts, as we'll see where these things are happening. So, what I think is interesting is if when you start to look at who's Who's doing the thinking about the, in, the incorporation of these robotic capacities within the existing um, disciplinary and professional context that are thinking about how do we move beyond not just the, the role of the digital data and smart in understanding um, ecologies, but how we might start to uh, utilize the capacities of robots to actually interfere and mediate and manage those contexts. And I just want to talk briefly about three contexts where that connect with, um, um, I suppose, the urban um, through particular sorts of disciplinary contexts. Oh. The first one is really in land landscape architecture. Where there was a really, it's a really um, interesting set of work by Cantrell and Holzman. It's around a book called Responsive Landscapes: Strategies for Responsive Technologies in Landscape Architecture. And there's a website that goes with this. It's um, about 2012 that gives you gives examples of the way in which digital technologies enable the sensing. Of, of conditions in landscapes, and they talk they took around a variety of different types of landscapes: coastal landscapes, estuarine, parks, urban landscapes. An example on the bottom left is a is a is a landscape that's responsive to atmospheric um, changes 
um, in an urban context. And what's interesting about that notion of, res of responsive landscapes is that it's, it's enabled um, landscape architects to think about the interrelationship between digital and the, the anal analytical capacities of digital environmental sensing and monitoring and the ability to start developing landscape assemblages that include um, automation and robotic technologies. Um, and that's been further developed in a more recent book um, called Robotic Landscapes, Designing the Unfinished, which is the idea that landscape design needs to not only needs to think about the way in which landscapes themselves through robotic capacities can be modified, can be modified and change after they've been designed. And there's experiments and ideas taking landscape designs around parks, uh, around ecological restoration that are trying to incorporate sort of robotic capacities to actually um, respond and mediate landscape change um, in, in, in response to changed ecological conditions. And that also includes experimenting with this sort of use of robots for the production of landscapes. But it's not solely within landscape architecture. Within um, uh, architecture, there's a history of interest in responsive, dynamic, kinetic, and adaptive architecture. And these are forms of architecture that use stationary, ro generally stationary robots in terms of the sort of design of buildings, which respond to changes in environmental conditions as facades through facade, the movement of facades. So there's this domain of architecture, which is really about the notion of the, the envelope of the building being able to uh, be enhanced through movement, through shading um, in response to um, overheating, but also to add other sorts of functional capacities. So the facade itself can follow sunlight to, to produce um, electricity, can collect water. So this sort of, this, this sort of interrelationship between movement and the building itself is a really uh, well-defined uh, domain within uh, within architectural design and analysis, and alongside that, there's another sort of set of um, uh, initiatives around the use of robots in robotic construction: drones, robot laborers, industrial robots, self-driving robots, bricklaying, concrete um, distributing robots. There's a huge um, set of experiments and products already available in that sector. So you start to look in architecture and you start uh, as well as landscape and you find this move into thinking about the role of robots and kinetics. Then the other um, example is a domain called ecological and ecosystems engineering. And these are the sorts of technical engineering, um, ecological expertise that's around the redesign, remediation of different types of ecological systems, um, ecosystems engineering, um, which includes things like prairie restoration, wetland restoration, mineland restoration, um, <clears throat> biomanipulation, um, even, even the creation of enclosed environments like Biosphere 2. And what one finds in this domain, which is very much around the sort of the role has traditionally been around the use of self-design, so the ecological systems that can be constructed by humans that provide um, nature-based services and capacities, um, and very much around the sort of notion of ecological restoration, are starting to experiment with the use of uh, robots and automated devices to enhance the capacity and engineering of these sorts of ecologies. So in these three domains in particular, you can start to see the way in which the boundary between the sort of an analytical capacities of digital technologies and the kinetic, the movement capacities of robotics are starting to be rethought and reincorporated into practice. Now, the significance of this um, is, um, is really important. In a, in a paper that... Uh, Andy, myself, and Aidan did in uh, recently in Geo Geoforum. We developed this idea around operational ecologies 
And this is trying to think through the rebundling of robotic and kinetic capacities in particular types of ecosystems to enable new functional capacities in the management and operation of those ecosystems or to even make them exist at all as potential exploitable resources. So what I want to do is, is give a little bit of a run through of a number of different domains in which these operational ecologies are active. In, in, in the paper, we were able to just choose a few, but actually I've been, I've been thinking a little bit more about how we might extend the way in which we, we think about operational ecologies into a particular, and why that might be important for us as urbanists as well. Um, just to try and think through how these uh, functional capacities are being reincorporated in very particular domains. And I just want to talk a little bit about the, the sorts of some of the emblematic and exemplary examples of where this is happening um, at some scale. So the first um, domain is to think a little bit about the sort of more remote operational spaces. These are the sort of operational landscapes that provide the different types of material resources that make actually make urban, urban life possible. And these are, uh, this sort of draws a little bit on some of the experience I've had here in Australia of trying to understand the way in which robotics are being incorporated into sort of um, eco particular sorts of ecosystems outside the urban domain, but obviously of significance for the urban domain in terms of the sort of res 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 critical resources that these provide um, that enable uh, urban life to work. I just want to choose three, there could be more, but I just want to choose three, which is around automated mining, agritech and, and, and maritime robots, just to give you a sense of the way in which the robotic is being layered and intertwined with an existing sort of, to solve particular sorts of problems and create new um, capacities in, um, in these three different contexts. So Australia, is one of um, a couple of locations that have um, a really well-developed um, automated mining capacity. Um, and the, the history of this has a very, very long history, um, which is partially, it's partially located in the difficulties of employing labor in these remote uh, mining contexts. It's not particularly attractive um, the, the environmental conditions are really quite difficult to support human life, um, particularly given the temperature. Not very attractive for, for families or for workers to work in. Um, really, really quite damaging uh, to humans. And that's partially, partially helped uh, accelerate the development of sort of automation and robotic technologies that have been layered over the sort of the development of digit data analytics, cloud computing, and sort of the analytical and in, in, in informational sensing systems that mine, mine and companies um, had utilized to try and enhance the efficiency and operation of mining complexes. And actually the, the sort of automation and the reuse of robotics has become uh, really prevalent in these large mining complexes. The use of uh, trucks, diggers, um, the use of tra automated train systems that connect the mines to uh, large logistical complexes on the coast. And what's really interesting about these sorts of um, aggregations and sy systematic use of robotics is they enable they enable uh, new sorts of economies. These systems can operate 24-7. Um, they, the, um, they provide new efficiencies uh, to enhance the operation of mining systems. And in interestingly, these are often controlled through um, control rooms. This one's a picture in um, Perth. The sort of complex itself can be controlled from uh, urban control systems that are located in Perth, Brisbane, that control a, a, a system that um, covers several thousand kilometers. 
So what's interesting is the way that sort of robotics enhance the productivity and efficiency of an existing resource frontier in quite uh, profound ways. Um, that, and the industry is trying to think, so the industry isn't necessarily fully automated, but the interest, the, these sorts of functional capacities have been aggregated and layered over to build increasing levels of autonomy in remote resource exploitation. To the extent that the industry is now trying to think about how would you design a mine um, to use robotics and automation, because this is very much be, has been traditionally around um, layering this over an existing mine complex. And the claim is this is more precise, more efficient, safer, uh, the notion of a risk-free enhanced mining experience. When one looks at agriculture, agritech, precision agriculture, you find sort of similar, similar sort of um, logic. Or some of, part of the reason, partly in the Australian context, was the unattractiveness of agriculture as a, as a career choice and the difficulty of retaining skilled labor um, in sort of re remoter agricultural contexts. And one of the visions of one of the companies here is to try to develop a control system that would enable a farmer to visit Sydney for the weekend, but to be able to leave the robot in charge of the, the, the farm. It's very, it's, and it's, it's, very, it's very interesting, some of the sort of the way the urban, urban imaginaries are mobilized in the sort of um, the development of these systems. Um, and that the agritech sector is a huge sector. I mean, it builds on already existing datification of, of agriculture and the use of drones, sensing, and building uh, on those sort of analytical capacities to start shifting into forms of um, robotic um, interventions. And there's a really, it's very interesting. If you want to, and if you wanted to find a, a smart ecology, um, a robotic ecosystem, you probably wouldn't necessarily look in an urban context go and have a look in an agricultural context where there's huge, huge development of um, different types of specialist robotics. Robot, robots that look after cows is one of the expertise they've developed at the, the Field Robotics Centre in Sydney University, but also for um, crop planting, maintenance, weeding, crop harvesting, processing, um, the strawberries that are available, the, sorry, there's robots that are available now to pick strawberries. And the linkage here with the problems of finding um, cheap labor for agriculture, you can see the way in which you know, these robots are expensive. Um, the industry itself is, is, is being uh, targeted um, as a new frontier for the development and application, which they claim to be more precise, more accurate. The claim is they require the use of less insecticide and resources. And part of the claim is that these are about the, de the development of a sustainable mode of agriculture. And then the third domain is probably a better, best understood as a, as a new resource frontier, which is maritime robotics huge amount of development of specialist maritime robots. Maritime robots to collect, collect and process plastic. This is an example of a, of a maritime robotic system called Mariner for growing kelp um, and using kelp as a biofuel. There's also other examples of using kelp for carbon sequestration. And these systems um, move large bodies of kelp between different sea levels. They take kelp down to nutrient-rich environments during the night. They move kelp to the surface during um, the daytime for it can grow through photosynthesis. And they claim to be able to sort of concentrate these huge beds of kelp, mobilized and moved by these maritime robots to processing sites across the ocean. So the, in the maritime sector, there's a, there's a huge amount of innovation, which a lot of it is around how new resource frontiers can be constructed. Uh, that are very difficult to access and difficult for humans to work in. So you start to see the way here then that robotics are enabling existing resource frontiers to be able to operate um, more efficiently and effectively to overcome ecological constraints on their development, 
to enable them to operate temporally um, uh, over over much long over extended time periods, and to create the context in which these sorts of systems can be used to seek out new resource frontiers and new opportunities for development and exploitation. Now, there's another domain in which robots are really active, and this is interestingly a really, really well developed um, domain, which is around threatened, threatened ecologies. And these are robots, perhaps, that we can characterize as saving nature. Um, uh, Ecologists, uh, re uh, researchers have been really very active in trying to think through the potential of robots to help them in their work. And some of this is really intriguing. Um, it's partly, and, and, and as part of that, they've been trying to sort of think a little bit quite carefully about a, a notion of, it, of environmental robotics. And um, as part of that, Let's sort of think about the, the operation of robots in ecology. So part of this is about how can they use um, drones, how can they use um, uh, vehicles as sort of um, data collection devices. But they've also been, and so this is about the repurposing of existing technologies, but they've also been very active in thinking about how they can develop specialist robots for ecological purposes. Um, and then there's a third category, what we, which they call eco-robots, that are e even more fascinating. These are robots that exist to take on board biophysical and biological functions in denuded ecologies. So just, just very briefly say a little bit about these. So, so yeah, there's, a, there's um, a huge amount of work being done on how um, drones um, vehicles can can collect data for ecologists about the conditions in particular sorts of environments but then there's also been sort of um, there's experiments with things like tree climbing robots specialist robots for collecting samples in the upper canopy of rainforests that would be otherwise very difficult to un to, to to collect data on um, really interestingly, we were doing some work in a Madagas enclosed Madagascan rainforest in Zurich, in Zurich Zoo, and this uh, huge uh, recreation of the Madagascan rainforest apparently had become very popular with ecologists in Europe, where they can develop and test these really specialist robotic applications um in a in a live uh, environment before they take them out into the real real rainforest so there's been a huge amount of innovation in terms of how how robots can um uh, drones and specialist types of robots that are often constructed not necessarily commercially but constructed for research purposes um can enhance the understanding of threatened ecologies but also how they can intervene as well so the use of um, drones for, sp for spreading seeds tree planting robots and other sorts of robots as well and it's these other sorts of robots that i think are particularly interesting and these are these are robots that in the context of an ecology that's threatened either by climate change or other forms of human intervention the the development of robotic capacities to substitute or enhance uh, ecological functions um, that enable that ecosystem to carry on existing. And there's a number of really interesting examples of that. There's the starfish killing robot that operates in the um, barrier reef, which is a robot that's designed to kill a, 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 star, a, a particular form of starfish that eats um, coral. And the sort of and it can do this um it can do this 24 hours it can do this um 24 hours it can do it with some um super human supervision um and also remotely um and the idea is that this can this enables um this invasive starfish to be managed through it being given a lethal injection and there's increasing examples of these sorts of robotic applications that substitute 
for, for biophysical and biological processes. On the top left there, there's an example of a pollination robot. This is in an agricultural context. That substitution, substituting for, for bees in terms of the in ensuring the reliable pollination of plants. This is obviously in a, in a, in a greenhouse context as well. There's a lot of develop. There's a lot of experimentation with the use of drones that um, intervene in um, peri-urban areas around interventions with uh, mosquitoes, partly about insecticide surveillance, but also about sterile insect release systems that interfere with the sort of the the normal biology and um, biological life cycle of mosquitoes. Um, there's other examples of plastic um, collecting robots in maritime environments to clean up uh, and try to maintain ecologies. These are what have been called ecobots. And these, I think, are particularly interesting because the claim here is that if it's not only, um, not only about knowing and monitoring an environment, but in order to manage and sustain a threatened environment, these sorts of applications enable the reproduction of the environment through the artificially mediated insertion of a robotic capacity within that ecological system. And then there's a whole set of work around urban ecosystems, specifically urban ecosystems. So I'm thinking here, if we think about the two prior examples as being about the sort of extended operational spaces in which um, urban contexts um, interrelate. There's been a, there's also work trying to think around sort of urban ecosystems and particular sorts of environments in which robots uh, can functionally operate in an, in an urban context. And just to very, very briefly give you a flavor about some of this work. So in a huge amount of investment in the good robot, the rescue robot, in sort of urban environments that have been subject to um, earthquakes, um, other sorts of um, other sorts of disasters and problems, collapsing buildings, landslides, uh, fire, um, sort of post-disaster context, where there's a huge amount of work in sort of developing uh, rescue robots and rescue systems. And the claim that the, the, the ro the, the, this sort of robot is able to sort of um, get into sort of spaces and places um, to, to secure uh, human life and to protect um, um, undertake rescue techniques. Actually, uh, lots of examples of attempts to sort of uh, model, test, simulate, use these sorts of systems, but actually in applications, they're not used very much. I don't think if you're in a context where you need to be rescued, for the moment, you wouldn't want to rely on a, uh, a robot. But it's very very interesting how the sort of denuded environment uh, that's that's problematic for human survival is has become such a focus and there's some interesting and slightly disturbing overlaps here between the use of these techniques and also military robots um, as well but one domain where there's thought being taken sort of taken place about how <clears throat> the robot can exist in a particular sort of urban ecology the other example where a lot of work is undertaken are sort of maintenance robots, um, robots that operate in spaces that are difficult for humans or hard for humans to reach, window cleaning robots on tower blocks, uh, maintenance robots in bridges, sewer robots as well. And these all seem very attractive, very interesting uh, applications and obviously uh, there's a lot of work that goes into developing these as products and services, uh, but I think some of the uh, some of the early some of the work that's been done on um, sewer robots in India are very interesting. Whereas there's quite a lot of develop, developmental work being done. Um, sewers are cleaned out by humans, and quite a lot of work's been done on the possibility of robots doing undertaking this work. And some of the early sort of work that's been done by um, uh, uh, urbanists on that is, is showing how 
these robots can't function in really tight and constrained spaces and that all that's happening is that the robot can do the very mundane work in in the conventional sewers but as soon as it gets into the really tight congested complex and unsafe context uh, where sewers need to be emptied humans are still expected to undertake that work but another way in which the urban is sort of um, environments that are seen as problematic for humans are also being sort of utilized as sort of test beds but the most interesting um, which are all interesting contexts and that, there's also been a set of work trying to think around the sort of role of robots in urban nature. Um, it's an interesting piece in Nature magazine <clears throat> um, that tried to start thinking about how what are the potentials um, for the sort of kinetically and robotically autom automated ecologies in an, in an urban context. And um, it sort of overlaps a little bit with um, what I talked about at the beginning um, in terms of sort of responsive landscapes, um, innovative sort of par parklands, multifunctional landscapes, green buildings, artificial ecosystems, and the way in which we've conventionally thought about those <clears throat> as contexts for the sort of delivery of ecosystem services, and the ways in which that can be enhanced and accelerated through robotic applications and there's a number of contexts in which that's starting to happen so there's initiatives like flora robotica which is a sort of um it's it's a sort of test bed to think about the the, the way in which robotic systems can uh, influence and manipulate the growth of plants on the outside of buildings within buildings and it's trying to think about how you can sort of think uh, you can develop sort of hybrid functionality between a living plant and a moving uh, robotic uh, surface and system to try to maximize the potential of plants for human benefits in terms of shading cooling um, it's really quite quite interesting thinking about sort of hybrid formations there's work being done by the eu on claiming that the urban mining of um, e-waste, uh, waste phones and computers, actually requires AI and robotic technologies to un can undertake those tasks more efficiently and effectively um, and, and avoid them having to be processed um, offshore. There's also the um, development of sort of smart, robotically enhanced sports stadiums is another interesting context. And also the use of enclosed ecologies for urban, the, the urban controlled environment agriculture in the bottom left, which are increasingly looking at the, um, not only a, a sort of artificially mediated uh, growing environment that doesn't require um, soil, uh, artificially managed lighting, uh, but also the use of robotic technologies to enhance the productivity and functionality of urban agriculture. And you can start to see the way in which this sort of intertwining starts to think through different levels of automation. So this was a piece of work undertaken, thinking about the way in which vertical farms, the urban vertical farm, could automate their systems in pursuit of mass market profitability, thinking about the ways in which human labor can be substituted and displaced through different levels of automation. And I think what this sort of signals is that we're not talking here about a sort of singular form of automated ecologies, is that these systems tend to develop um, incrementally. Um, they build up through, I suppose, particularly contingent and contextually developed forms of automation in which um, different, types of different types of systems are tested and experimented with and then extended into other domains as well. And the final example I want to talk about, a one that I think is actually quite, feel more positive uh, and a little bit more excited about is, is the domestication of these robotic ecologies. And um, in particular, I'm interested here in the way in which um, 
our conventional understanding of the smart home, um, I think, has tended to focus on what happens inside the smart home. Um, so the smart home has, has largely been largely not solely been conceived in terms of the sort of interior um, in terms of security, convenience, the automation of cleaning, um, control of systems, energy management, alarms, um, security. But I think there's an interesting, um, cer certainly uh, in the Australian and other contexts as well, there's been this sort of um, shift to try to think about, not just about the, the sort of ambient environment of the interior of the smart home. There's also been this shift to start thinking about the outdoor environment of the smart home as well. And there's been the emergence of something um, called sort of smart gardening um, as the sort of the monitoring and the sensing capacities of digital technologies themselves are starting to be led with um, new functional capacities to manage light, water, nutrients and weeding in the uh, exterior of the, 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 the smart home. There's also some fascinating work being done on the utilization of drones as part of those systems, but also for security. And there's the emergence of a quite distinctive market in new products and services that are not just about the analytical capacity of those technologies to sense the environment, but also about forms of interventions. So, particularly in Australian context, if you go to a DIY store like, like Bunnings, there's a, 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 a penelope, a, a sort of like a brick large of different types of technologies around robotic weeding, robotic um, lawn mowers, uh, grill cleaning. You can buy um, smart weather stations, um, um, irrigation systems, and some of these you control from your phone as well, the utilization of drones. And the actual, it's quite interesting, the sort of um, domestic space of the garden, to some extent, is becoming sort of in, through some of these sorts of services and systems, which are increasingly integrated with one another, is almost becoming sort of uh, mobilized as a particular form of operational ecology. Um, Gardino <clears throat> are one of them are, are an interesting example of a company that sort of increasingly sells an interconnected sort of set of systems and platforms that enable you to layer these technologies together <clears throat> and link them with um, specialist weeding um, uh, weeding and um, robots that actually functionally operate in the garden. There's a system really quite complex system called FarmBot, which not only can plant seeds, uh, monitor water, weed them, you can, you can play, if you have the technical skills, you can play around programming these sorts of systems yourself. So there's a lot of sort of, there's a lot of DIY system building that goes on around these to make these sort of work fun functionally. And the claim is, the claim is that they can sort of enable you to have more time, they can displace the need to do routine activities, enable you to enjoy your outdoor garden. Um, and these systems are often used inside the home as well. So there's an example there of a sort of growth automated um, kinetic growth chamber. And I think what all of these sort of systems point to is the way in which um, perhaps there's a possibility of the sort of way in which these systems can be rethought, redeveloped, um, according to other sorts of criteria, they're not solely around uh, efficiency and exploitation. And I think this whole sort of sector is worthy of more work and the way in which perhaps the sort of the, the, the values of the sort of agri-tech sector could become sort of disrupted in which we might think more productively of other ways of connecting these sort of capacities with more more sort of sustainable practices in the garden. So why does all this matter? So I'll just come to sort of, I'm not sure this is a conclusion, but I mean, I, I really 
think we need to sort of try to widen the debate about the environmental implications of sort of robotics with a lot of really good work being done on digital telecommunications and this example here the environmental sustainable sustainability of ai which i think you know this raises a lot of the really critical issues about environmental justice so who's automate you know what are the costs of automated environments who who gains and who loses from them what what's the shit work that's created um uh, to enable robotic autonomy the rebound effects in terms of questions of re the, the, the exploitation of new resource frontiers and um, increasing consumption, the trade-offs that, that take place, and who's responsible for thinking about the ecological conditions. Now, I think they're all right, but there's something that's different about robotics that's led over the top of these questions, which is about, I think, that the issue that this, that, that, that what I've took, the sort of landscape is that increasingly robotics are being seen as critical to the operation of these landscapes and yet the sort of um in intrusion and develop and sort of development of robotics has not really been subject to much critical scrutiny and analysis about well what you know what's happening here and what are the sorts of questions that need to be considered and i think that that's becoming really significant partly partly because of the level of concentration, these robotic, particularly the robotic software platforms, the US and China predominate in the development of those systems. They're highly concentrated. And, and, and at the same time, there's a, there's a lot of attempts being made to standardize these sorts of technological systems through standard setting organizations. So there's a high degree of path dependency being developed and a high level of concentration in the production of these systems, which means that they're going to develop, the logic of their development um, is somewhat closed and controlled. And I don't think it's been subject to enough sort of anticipatory scrutiny about the implications and consequences of them. And they're increasingly being assembled into sort of ecosystems themselves. A um, couple of examples here around from ABB, a big um, Swedish robotic uh, provider and Amazon's robotic acquisitions that the robotic systems themselves are being assembled into ecosystems themselves that operate within ecosystems. So there's some really complex things happening here that the ecosystemic nature of these of technologies um, almost gives them sort of like an infrastructural capacity. There was an ex example I was looking at recently where there's a, there's a suggestion that even um, warehousing itself could be thought of as an infrastructure, a robotically enabled warehousing itself can be th thought about in the urban context as an infrastructural capacity that can be mobilized for the distribution of uh, multiple um, um, uh, systems of distribution and so these developments mean that I think we need we need to start thinking carefully before the logic is too embedded um, and not can't be subject to other sorts of social and environmental criteria and this question about the sort of level of autonomy that's associated with the different types of operational ecology that I've talked about we need to have a sort of we need to have an understanding about where does this is an, this is an example from the mining sector of these different levels of autonomy and i think we need to start to try to understand the way in which the operate these different sorts of operational ecologies of the garden the farm the home park the different sites of the, the mosaic of ecologies themselves become subject to different levels of autonomy and where does the human sit within these in terms of providing some sort of oversight and understanding of what's happening? Um, and that debate, I don't think we've really been, uh, been, been able to have. And I think it probably raises some really quite profound questions that about the interrelationship between the machine environment and the human. And um, it started to make me think a little bit about sort of our, our, our 
pre-existing debates about cyborg urbanism and how we might start to understand the changing relationships between the human, the, the, the ecological and the technological and the way in which the environment itself is increasingly, it's not only understood through digital and smart technologies, it's operated through robotics and robotic and kinetic capacities. And there's a lot going, there's a lot going on here. And I'm, I, I'm sometimes wondering the extent to which urban studies has all of the, all of the um, sort of conceptual um, understanding to, to really try to, I think we need to look a little bit outside our sort of conventional um, boundaries to try to think where, how can we think this, how can we think through these sorts of new forms of um, interrelationships? Um, and I'm really struck by, there's, there's a really fantastic chapter by Catherine Hales in a, in a book, it's available online, that I've found really, um, uh, really helped in sort of thinking through a little bit about what might be happening here. And um, Catherine Hale's uh, work in this chapter, she talks about you know, the, the sort of global challenges of, of climate hunger and thirst and the, and the way in which the STEM disciplines, the science, technology, um, dis uh, management, engineering disciplines, who are predominantly focused on this sort of production of robotic technologies require health from the humanities. And she thinks about it through this sort of the, the modification of a concept of species. And she talks about the role of species in common, the specificities, the human qualities, which mean that we have to take responsibility for thinking about planetary futures. She also talks about the sort of species in symbiosis, recognizing the entanglement between humans and different notion and, and the ecological animals, plants, botanics, the mi micro um, microbiomes and the, and the complex interrelationships and uh, that are formed between humans and, and, and more than human life. But she also talks about species in cyber, cyber symbiosis, uh, cyber symbiosis, emphasizing the interconnection between humans and computational media. And I think actually we need to extend that notion of computational media to be able to stretch to include this robotic and kinetic capacity. And she starts to talk, to talk about the, the development of a more integrative relational and ecology in which the interactions between humans, non-humans and computational media extended, I would say, into the robotic, provide the basis for understanding the interdependencies and species specificities that enable us to make progress to meeting challenges. And I found this really quite profound and quite important and I think it poses a challenge for us in terms of, and I, this is by way of conclusion, and it's and in some ways it's not a conclusion because I think I raise more questions for myself than I, I have answers. But I think as urbanists, I try to think what do we what do we need to do, and I think we need to think about the multi-sided operational ecologies of these sorts of process of these symbiotic relationships. So. We need to sort of think beyond, we need, we need to sort of overcome, I need to overcome my metrocentric view of, the, of urban ecology and robotics. And the importance of understanding and learning from these sort of remote operational spaces, but also I think from the possibilities of these micro domestic operational spaces um, in which we can start to try to understand the sort of problematics and possibilities of robotics and how it can be uh, intertwined in perhaps more productive ways. I think related to that is trying to unpack the sort of strategic logics of these operational ecologies, particularly trying to understand which of these are about the production of new resource frontiers, which themselves could be problematic, which are them about <coughs> the production <coughs> of more efficient ways of exploiting ecologies, and what are the possibilities in the sort of conservation ecologies and the new risks that are associated with that if ecological systems become reliant on the operation of technology for them to function effectively? And I think what this means, and I apologise for not doing this, but in a way, I think the challenge 
is to sort of rethink um, that long lineage of work that's been undertaken on cyborg urbanism and to re-bring into that a sort of attempt to explore the sort of notions of contingent and flexible autonomy that might be created between the human, the modern human and the, the technological um, and to think about the differential reshaping of those relationships in different types of configurations and operational ecologies and the ways in which that might be done. And I think we possibly do have to also resurrect some of our interest in the sort of sustainable operation of these systems to think about how we might create more sustainable, socially just and productive relations between the technical and ecological and I think that's my hour, so I will, I will stop there. Thank you.